when this all happened, and that will come up again later. So please join me again, and he is currently living in New Jersey.
And that's what we wanted to advocate about, seeing the process, seeing how a, a person, after they're under duress for almost 30 hours, question how they're being fed with the, with the, with the uh, police perceived to be the facts, and how they put the whole story together. And it's really done on video. It's just that our eyes are trained to just say, hey, he said he did it, he must be guilty. Send him, send him to jail, do whatever you want to do with him. But we want you to analyze the whole process. See it from the beginning when you first come in and you sit down, and how it builds up, how the whole uh, rug is being pulled from the unit. So, one of the things that this film will do in the series that David and Bernard is doing is again, tell the story to a generation of folks who may not know it, tell the story to people who should know it, so that we understand um, what our system can do at its worst. Um, Nisi, tell us what drew you to this production, what drew you to this role, and tell us uh, about your role in this. Well, what, what drew me to the role, and this is such a crazy thing, how God works. I had known about this case for a long time. I had seen different specials about it, different news coverage about it, and the funny thing, every single time I ran across it, even if it was one I already saw, I stopped and watched it again. Never met these guys from anywhere. Didn't know anyone who knew them personally, but I was so drawn to the case. You know, and if I had to walk out to go somewhere, let me go and record, because I'm gonna come back and watch it again. Little did I know that I was carrying a burden for people I never met. And many years later, the project comes about, and I'm like, oh my God, I know this story. I, I know, I, I, I'm so familiar. And I leaned in and ended up playing the mother of Corey Wise, who's not here today. But of the group, he was the oldest at 16. So going from the courtroom to Rikers Island is, is, is uh, no small feat at that age. And I will tell you I applaud Ava because in the filming, I've never worked on a project before where they had crisis counselors available to us when we got off of work. Um, and it, some days it was necessary. And I will tell you that as a mother, filming the scenes, you know, where you, um, you're fighting for something is one thing. But the scenes where you're in the courtroom and they're taking your child away, you know, as a mother, I, 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 my heart just broke. And I was like, and I wanted to make sure I was a part of responsible storytelling. Because it's a lot when you characterize people who are still alive, they're still with us. And so you want to bring integrity and humanity and all of the things that you can, you can bring to it. But after doing the project was when I raised my hand and said, how can I be a part of the Innocence Project? How can I say? My personal takeaway with that is that you don't have to know anybody who has been through this to know um, the heartbreak and how you would feel if you or one of your loved ones was going through this. And so, and I don't even know exactly what all I will do, but I'm here to do something. I'm here to shop from the rooftop. I'm here to wear a t-shirt. <laughs> do what you gotta do to pull me in. Uh, but I definitely want to be um, a part of this in a very real way, not just through my art, but through my real life as well. And we welcome that, absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
could have helped you and made this result different? So, what that brings to mind is this experience we had when we first started swimming at Central Park Five Mile Region. Mm -hmm. We were in California, and I think we may have had some technical difficulties. I think we had been in this league here, but it was a standing, it was like a room full of like this, but more folks than was here. And I remember a young girl sitting up and saying to me, she said, You know, I have a question. I know we're going to have a QA after this, but I have a question. I'm a dad, 13 years old. And I want to become a cop. What advice can you give me? And I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, what quickly happened was me being able to understand that I was talking to the future. And so in talking to the future a lot of times, I think about not the prosecutors of today who are part of the system that we're trying to dismantle, but in terms of black sky thinking, how can we talk to the future to ensure that the individuals that are coming into these positions are doing their jobs? And so I talked to this young lady, I said, you know, on the, cop, on the, on the side of cop cars, around the nation now, as I've been traveling, we see the words to serve and protect. And on the side, side of cop cars in New York City, particularly, we see the words courtesy, professionalism, and respect. I don't believe Eric Gardner had lost his life again, as I was telling this young lady this, but since then I've also mentioned the fact that they didn't give Eric Gardner the first letters off of the side of the cop cars. They didn't give him CPR. And so the reality of the matter is that this young woman wants to volunteer her position, herself, her body, to be the security of the rest of the people in the community. She would be one of the best officers in hands down. Because the reality is that there are far more good actors in the battle than there are bad actors. But that single bad actor can mess up the whole bunch. I bring you to the story as well, just this quick thing about my my attorney, Bill Clinton. He was a long time said that, that he says that that's a terrible myth of organized society. That everything that is done is done. Through the established system uh, that seems that the established legal system. And that word has a powerful psychological impact. It makes people believe that there is an order to life, an order to the system. And that person that goes through that and is convicted has gotten all that is due him. And therefore, society can turn its consciousness off and look to other things and other times. And I think that that's something important we have to understand. Even as citizens, Folks that may not have any understanding about folks, like we, we, we're the right? We're families, we're people who've gone through the fire, we're, we're the ones that know this stuff. And we're trying to talk to other people on the streets. We're trying to draw them support of people kind of passing us by. But as citizens, if they understand that this systemic thing that is going on, that disproportionately puts black and brown fires back in a state of slavery, has to change. Yeah. And to be able to do this And so the future generations of folks who took our DNA samples, right? right? And didn't blow the whistle right. immediately and say, hold oh, on, man, something ain't right. Mm -hmm. These samples from these individuals don't match the sample that was on the job. They could have sent that. They won. But yet what they did was the technology. I remember they, they, they put on the headlines of the newspapers, they said DNA evidence. And if folks wasn't watching all, all the time, when the DNA evidence didn't match which they reported, that was quickly swept under the rug. And what was left was the negative residue of that broad headline that said DNA evidence. So now, today, even now, Folks say to themselves, you know, I think this, this Cinephone Yonder case, you know, the Cinephone Five, they got, they got released because of some type of technicality. They don't know that dioxymicronucleic acid. <laughs> Oh, DNA. 
like this. No, this is the no, dioxin Bible will clear the acid free dose. That
Because when I came in the 80s, it was so much of a media frenzy, people didn't use logic. Like Yusuf said, DNA evidence. It was so sexy to see that, but they didn't see the real story behind it. How we all was raised by families. How I have four sisters. How I have two daughters now. I have women around me, so I have to really have to be on my job to, to ensure that I never want, want nothing to happen to them like that. Or for anybody, whatever race or culture you are, because it's about being human. So I just want them, my daughter, per se, when she sees this, to really take a, take a deep breath, because it's going to be very emotional, but very, very educational as well, and very informative. And I just want her to prepare her for the madness that she's going to see. But it's very necessary. So this won't happen to another Central Park father, or another Emmett Till, yes, yes. You know, or another Scott Boyd. Right. And the list goes on. So I just want to make sure that I really get that through to her. And what's important about your dad? And so why would you continue to give back and be an advocate in this space? Um, one, because being 14 and 15 years old, going through this experience that we went through, we didn't know that we had a village, right? We were shut down. And it wasn't until this doc came about that we started to notice that we did have it, and that we had to use our voice and use our platform. And that's why we started doing the public speaking, and we started going to colleges and junior high schools and high schools in the beginning. Um, and it was an awakening, awakening that we had a job. When you see these young kids and, and they don't know that it's a war, and the war is for the system to have them occupy a jail cell than occupy a college. Yeah. It's that easy. And so we, had, we, we decided that we had to use our voice to try to make a change. Because now it was about the kids. You know, it's about the kids. And, and this room shows that. It shows that we're not an isolated incident. It happens all the time. And now we have tons of voices that are ready to go out and speak and also give out a message to save our youth. Because that's what's at stake. That's the thing. That's our future.
so that people hear it. So um, she mentioned, you know, talking about the impact on your communities and your families. And when you came home, um, what was that experience like in navigating the world when you came back? Uh, particularly after 2002, so there's a story when you came home after you served your sentence. But then another story from 2002 when everybody realized that you had done it. What, what, what was the community response in those, those two different time periods? I'm going to ask all of you that question. You know, so one of the things I, I, I try to, I'm still, I'm still coming back. That's just weird because at the end of the day, when something like this happens to a person, at such a young age, it's difficult to be able to push all the way forward because you have this void. Corey said to us in LA that it was such a heartbreaking thing. And it was something that resonated with I think every single one of us. He said, you know, I have a hole yeah. inside. Yeah. You know, and I was like, when he said that, I was like, damn, I haven't, I haven't dealt with the past 30 years. I put it on my back and moved forward to do what I got to do. But then now it's like this time to deal with it, you know? And as I looked at my life, I just recently posted a photo on social media. And two photos, one photo was a photo before, like a few days before I got locked up. And then the second photo was a few days after I came home from prison. And in the second photo, I looked shell shocked. I didn't see this in the social media thing, but I looked shell shocked. And it was that whole notion that inside, here we have these indelible scars, but inside I had to walk around the community with my hair down. Because Kevin said it once, he said it best, when he said, you know, we, we, we stop becoming known as, oh, that's my man Kev from, you know, one Tim Street. It was like, oh yeah, that's Kev. And as we're walking away, we hear whispers of people describing us as, oh, he's such a long time to meet us. He's one of the And it wasn't popular. Because people still have this, this, this idea because of the way that they were tricked with the media. They believed that we had something to do with something that happened. Completely ignoring the fact that there were folks who were picked out of lineups who assaulted people that night. There were folks who went to jail for assaulting people that night. There were people that were assaulted who came to the courthouse in order to witness that was asked, do you see the person or persons who did this to you? And in every single one of our cases, they looked around the corner and looked at us and said, it wasn't any one of these guys. And so to see the shift, I think the shift was a beautiful thing. To see the shift where at one point we were riots, we were cast outs. You know, this thing that BC Nash is talking about, so this, this pulling down the fabric of the fiber of the family and the fabric of the fiber of the society. That leaves holes. We're living with those holes. Our families are living with those holes. Our communities are living with those holes. And these are three, four, five, ten, hundreds of representations that are magnified and rippled throughout to represent one another. And so, but the shift was a real thing. Because it's something that I didn't have to, like it used to be. Well, you would the city be like, okay with being labeled as a central park five. I'm like, oh man, it's hard to say yes. But now I'm like, hey, yo, I wanted a central park five. <laughs> <laughs>
the ship, the ship was, the ship became more positive um, after the doc came out. Because even after the exoneration, there was still all the green models that we were still guilty of something. We got off on the technicality. Uh, city council helped us get off. Like, it was just all these, these, uh, these uh, movements. And so when the doc came out, the doc silenced a lot of that stuff because now you got to see, you got to see that visual of us. You got to see that black woman. And so overall, it was more positive. But we still walked on hope. Like we still walk on eggshells. To this day, we still don't know how to fully put our lives back together because of that gap. And, and everybody, a lot of people can understand what we're saying. Right? Um, it's still a struggle every day. Because when you do see somebody, they do recognize you. You don't know what you're going to get. You know, so it's a roll of the dice. Um, and that lady in the Central Park Five, we didn't have no say so that. That was just given to us, and we had to hold that. And now, it's like Raymond Santana sent you for a fire. Like, I cannot get rid of it, you know? But every day, it's just a struggle. We don't know when it'll end. All we can do is just move forward together as brothers and try to get over that line. Yeah, and you know, I said I'm gonna end with asking what we could do to help fill that hole, but I hope that you all recognize, I know that the audience will support me in saying that, that, that you got a hope and you were giving us a gift of, of, of helping us face reality and understand what it is you have to do to so that this never happens again. And you, you don't have to do that, so we are grateful for it. And I do want to know, what can we be doing as a society, as a community, as people, as this family here at the Innocence Network to better support you all? Um, but just, yeah, yeah. So, Kevin, do you want to add any more to this conversation about what it felt like during this time? Man, you know, being, being released at that time, you know, it was, um, felt like a newborn baby starting all over again, trying to adjust to society. It was actually like society, society trying to adjust to me, because I felt at the time that I was an outcast. During those years in prison, for something they didn't do, which everybody knows about this in this room. And I'm so honored to be around fellow exonerates that, that went through. We went through, we have different stories, but we all have one result. So, just, I remember a story real quick. When I came home, we used to use tokens in New York City. And then when I came home, it was a metro car. And I was totally lost. I didn't even know what to do. What I'm doing here. And it, it was, it's funny now, but it was sad at the time. You know what I mean? Because it was just trying to adjust. So I think now, like we're still trying to get our lives together. You know, like the settlement happened, okay. But that didn't change the years that we lost. No money will take back the years that we lost. You know, so now I just want to uh, move forward. And I, now in my 40s, I think I'm living my best life. Partially, you know what I mean? So I just want to thank you. But what I do love is that I feel like we have a lot of free 
responsible storytellers now and a lot of, of responsible people who are really trying to support the truth. And those are the people who we have to support in what they're doing. You know what I mean? You have to get behind the people who you know are advocates for justice. And that is what we're seeking, all the truth. I mean, you know, because at the end of the day, that's the most important part. But what happens is a lot of times if you say it first, whether it's true or not, that's the fire that's lit and people run with it. But we got to just stop and say, wait a minute, where are the outlets that we go that we know usually are getting it right most of the time? And supporting not only those outlets, but those filmmakers and those storytellers to be able to say, hey, here is um, a way to look at it where we have dissected it from every side. You know what I mean? And I think that's the part that's super important. And then the other part that I wanted to just say about is really what support looks like in, in it and out of it. Because it's a different thing that's required. At least that was my experience after having, having done this project, that you may need one thing on the inside, but then when you come out, you're going to need another thing. And really trying to be a part of the rehabilitation and reintroduction back to society, depending on how long you may have been away, and whether that's through the workforce, whether that's through prayer, whether that's through counseling, whether it's through you know providing some sort of um, resource. You know, um, there's always something you can do. Absolutely, and I think that everybody in this audience is here because they need that. So, I mean, it's an easy point out a great point that we have to look at those who are seeking the truth and, and we have to ride their boats at them and piggyback off of them and, and spread the word. I mean, social media now is a great platform because now our young, our young generation, you can sit there and say something and they'll call you out quick about it and say, you know. Um, and so I do think that we do see a change now, we do see a shift where it is more seekers of truth, and we just gotta keep supporting them. And, and supporting them like this. Kevin, you wanna add anything? Well, just to uh, give a helping hand and do, do your job, basically. And if we all do that collectively, I think it'll be a change, or at least it'll be a start of it. But we have to start doing something now. We have to, and we have to form together because it's when we in the, in the group, it makes it more better. <laughs> you know, um, a lot of people don't think they're really going to support that. Why don't you flesh that a little bit? Thank you. 
looking at Twitter runs and spikes in the community usage. Check this out. And they went to this website called wayback.com. Where they went to show This is what the website said before. This is what the website said now. This is the short term record. And it was a big thing to be able to see that. But people, people were able to, you know, put their families through college because they, they got raises and bonuses and promotions. They were able to go on great vacations and have a wonderful life. All because of this lie. And like I said, this was a pointer that should have said at least every case of that should have been reinvestigated. But we know that this was a, a, a tried and true method that they were using to make people believe this lie. So therefore, all of these cases, these detectives didn't, they weren't doing fights, they didn't come around the long point scene just now. Mm -hmm. These folks were seasoned detectives that were on the job 20 years in order to be able to be entered into this elite division of detective to come in and tell the rest, you know. But the other thing about the media is, is that there's a book called The Art of Justice. I forget the art of the, the name of the uh, authors, but one of the authors was the whole new artist that went around to almost all of the famous cases, and she was the one that drew the people. Yeah. And in this part, she comes to the Sin Law Jonathan case, and she tells this narrative of, you know, during the trial, the families used to come to me and ask me to draw us in a more sympathetic way, you know. And she says that, you know, many times when we, when we weren't, uh, when our faces weren't covered, we had hostility on our faces. She didn't talk about why we had hostility, right? Then she says, later when it was found that they didn't do it, I was filled with regret because of the way that I had drawn them. And see, that's the people's minds are shaped by these narratives that are from us. And that's why this new piece coming out on Netflix is going to be so important, because it's an opportunity to tell a different narrative, to tell the correct, the truth. So what happened I asked you all? And you know what the last question is, so what happened I asked you that you want to make sure that everyone hears today? And once I accomplished those things, I could already 
I don't know. So all I can do is take it one day at a time and try to live my best life at that moment and fulfill my dream. That's it. Just for everyone to include myself, to use your power, your platform, or whatever you have. And we in this day and age will be on social media that you really didn't have back then. So use that to our advantage to get the results that we want. So we just have to be, be more productive just to help out. That's it.
another bill. And so we need all of you all to, in your communities where you are, to be in your schools, in your colleges, telling your stories so that people understand and see the real human person. If you're not a statistic, we talk about the numbers, but you're real people. And my favorite part, this is not my first in World Conference. Um, it's at least my third or fourth. And, and I was brought behind like a baby when it happened this time. So when you see the stage and you call the names across the stage of the people who most recently called, who were wrongfully convicted, you are people, you are our family, you are our friends. And we need to be out in the communities reminding people of who you are and what happened to you. And we, and, and again, when we talk about language, we're still developing the language of what do we say? How do we, how do we talk about your experience and how do we make sure that, that you have the resources available to you? One of the things we talked about in great detail is there's a lot of victim money that's available that's being released by the federal government to the states on a regular basis. And how do we get them to see that you have been victimized by this experience and are entitled to the resources to help you heal? So I want to thank everybody who came out for this conversation to hear that for listening. The documentary is called When You See Us. When they see us. Excuse me. When they see us. When they 